Welcome to our video module on dynamics. Today, I'd like to talk about degrees of freedom. We hear this term bantered about quite a bit, especially when we're talking about how many equations do we need to describe a system. And if we under, want to understand exactly what is a degree of freedom, a good way to see it is uh, how many variables do we need to know in order to completely describe the system? For example, one can imagine a cart going across the ground and if we want to know its position, all we need to know is how far it's moved in the horizontal direction. Or if we had a uh, pendulum swinging in this direction and we wanted to know where it was, the only thing we would need to know is the angle through which it was subtended. These are examples of one degree of freedom. We only need one piece of information. Generally, in 2D, you're going to have one degree of freedom due to the x direction. You're going to have one degree of freedom due to the y direction. And then you're going to have one degree of freedom due to rotation. Now let's look at some examples. First, we could imagine that we have a particle on some body or on some plane. We can see that since it's a particle, we're going to ignore any rotation, so there's not going to be any rotation. However, it can move horizontally and it can move vertically. So therefore we have two degrees of freedom. Or we can imagine, you know, we're watching curling at the Olympics curling stone traveling and you'll notice it can go horizontally, it can go vertically, and it can also rotate. So that means we're going to have three degrees of freedom. Finally, one can imagine gears engaging. You have a gear here, a gear here, and if we simply know the angle through which these gears have turned, we'll say uh, that's uh, phi, we can identify everything we need to know, and in this case we're only looking at rotation. That's a single degree of freedom. Now we can also use this idea with more complex systems. For example, we can imagine a double pendulum, and in this case we have the first angle theta and the second angle phi. So in this case we have a pendulum we really have two rotations. So we have a two degree of freedom system. So this leads to a general equation. Let's take the number of rigid body, bodies. Remember every stone, every object that's moving around that can rotate, that's going to have three degrees of freedom. So we take number of rigid objects times three, and we'll notice that every particle it can move horizontally and vertically, but it can't rotate. So it has two degrees of freedom, so number of points. We're going to multiply it by two, and then every time we have a constraint, we're going to subtract a degree of freedom. So what are some good examples of constraints? So I've gone ahead and created a little red table similar to the ones above it. Just looking at constraints, the first one is a pivot. A pivot allows a rigid body to rotate, so it doesn't allow it to translate, it doesn't allow it to move. So it's taken away two constraints. So the circled number on the right is two. You can think of it one of two ways. You can either think of the pivot as what does a constraint allow, how many of degrees of freedom does it allow, or if you want to use it in the equation, you look at how many of degrees of freedom has it removed. And a pivot doesn't allow translation vertically or horizontally, so it's removed too. The next one is a cylinder. Well, that block inside used to be able to rotate. It can't rotate anymore. And it used to be able to move up and down. It can't do that. So the cylinder introduces two constraints. Finally, we look at a string holding a rigid body. That rigid body can still rotate and it used to be able to move horizontally and vertically, and now it's constrained along an arc. 
so we've really removed one of the degrees of freedom. Let's remember that this equation equals the uh, degrees of freedom. So let's look at the pendulum. We can look at the first string ball as one body because we care about its rotation and the second string ball is a second body so the number of rigid bodies is two we multiply that by three there's no particles here so that's a zero times a two and take a look at the constraints we have two pivots each one of those pivots knocks off two degrees of freedom so it's two times two that's six minus four or two perfect next we can take a look at the gears First, we have two rigid bodies. Whoops, two rigid bodies. Once again, no points. And now we're going to subtract our constraints. Well, we have a pivot right here and another pivot. So that's two constraints. But in addition, there's a rolling contact here. So that's going to be an additional constraint. Minus three on both of those gears. So we have six minus six equals zero. So there's one degree of freedom, otherwise the thing wouldn't move. Where have we gone wrong? Well, remember when I defined this equation, I also said that sometimes constraints can interfere, and that's what we see here. We've overemphasized the constraints when we looked at the effect of the two pivots and the requirement that both of these interact. So really, if we wanted to write this equation correctly, this equation will always give us equal or less than the number of the degrees of freedom in real life. And this is why this equation seems really more like a guide. I personally find our original definition of how many variables do we need to describe the system far more reliable in identifying degrees of freedom. Another easy way to identify the degrees of freedom of a system is to identify the number of constraints in one of the bodies, add it to the number of constraints of the next body, add it to the number of constraints of the next body until you've described the entire system. So for instance in the pendulum, the first pendulum has one degree of freedom. The second one also has one degree of freedom. We want to explain it, combine the two. As we get more into constrained motion, I'd recommend you take some time and look more carefully at the types of motion we see and especially the types of constraints that we often see. I hope this gives you a good intuition of what degrees of freedom mean and how to use them in a, ba in a basic way.